Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to INE Live. My name is Rohit Pardasani, and I am a senior instructor here at INE. And today at INE Live, I have two of my mentors and legends who have actually given so much to the IT industry. I have Brian McGann and I have Mark Snow with me today. So today in this INE Live discussion, I would be discussing with them about their latest, uh, uh, basically their accomplishments and their perspective on the IT industry. So let's first meet legend number one, Brian McGann. Good morning, guys. Mark, it's great to see you, buddy. Rohit, thanks for having me. And let's see legend number two, Mark Snow. Hey, guys. Nice to see you. Brian, great to see you. Rohit, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, it's, 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 it's in fact so amazing to have both of you here in this platform. Uh, you know, before we actually get started, there's something that I would like to share that... Um, I'm actually super excited to be hosting this right now because I don't know if you guys know, but um, I have personally learned everything from both you people. So you have always been my mentor. So routing switching security was always from Brian and all of voice, whatever I know about voice has been from Mark Snow. So I'm like really excited just to have you guys in front of me and me hosting you guys. Thank you, Rohan. So, yeah. So before we actually start this uh, discussion, what I'm going to be doing is I will ask a bunch of questions to you guys, basically to both of you. And um, if any of you, any of the viewers want to ask a question, they can put that up, up on chat and I can ask you guys those questions. So let's quickly get started. My first question to you is, uh, to Brian, what certifications do you currently possess? Uh, good question, Rohit. Thanks. Uh, so uh, like Rohit said, guys, my name is Brian McGann. I'm a CCIE, uh, Cisco CCIE in routing and switching, which is now called enterprise infrastructure. I'm also a CCIE in security, service provider and data center, and then a Cisco certified design expert, a CCDE. Nice. Just a few. That's a lot of Cisco certifications. And I have a lot of time on my hands, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. What about you, Mark? Yeah, so I am a CCIE. I first got mine in voice back when it was still voice. Um, I am also a CCIE in security, a CCIE in data center. And then 10 years after I did voice, I chose not to just take the exam to change it uh, from voice to collaboration, but to arduously go through the whole thing again and, um, and did the collaboration. Uh, so I also have a CCI collaboration, but since voice and collaboration are the same, I kind of call it like three and a half. It's not really four. Yep. <laughs> and then I, I also I, in fact, a... did, uh, collaboration also. So yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. And... So, so Mark is one of the uh... only guys, Mark is one of the only guys in the world that has every CCI except routing and switching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Usually that's the first one. That's usually you the know? first one, right? Hey. Yep. I think he went from the other side. I it actually still was remember the first one that I. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it actually was the first one I started. I tried. I, I bought all the gear. I took it one attempt, and then I, voice was announced, and it was what I was doing every day. So I switched. Yeah. What year was that? Do you remember? Uh, I took the first exam in 02. 02. It was right after they had switched from the two day to the one day. So. I think that was the time when I was doing CCNA. Yeah. Yeah, you're making me feel old now. <laughs> no. So, yeah, uh, so Mark, how did you achieve your first CCIE? Yeah, like I said, I was studying at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, for routing and switching. And um, so I was already in that study mode. I had, you know, bought all my gear. I had um, been studying for about eight months. And I took the exam and, and voice came out and I switched um, because it was really what I was doing every day in a, in a day-to-day -day fashion. Um, it took a lot of time and effort. Uh, really, there's no shortcutting it. So there was a lot of reading, uh, a lot of trying, a lot of going back and rereading and really understanding, and then going back and, you know, trying those, those concepts out again. And it, it took getting to the place where I not only understood the technology 
uh, and the underlying protocols, but I was able to be fast at them as well. And, and I think it, it takes both. So besides reading, you had a, a hands-on gear that you were practicing on. I did. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to be able to procure most of the gear. Um, <clears throat> at the time there was a Catalyst 6500 with a expensive 6608 blade full of T1s and a buddy of mine from Cisco was able to get me a loaner on that. Um, otherwise I don't know if I would have been able to make it, but, but I was fortunate enough to have the gear and, uh, and yeah, a lot of, a lot of practice and hands-on. Nice. What about you, Brian? How did you achieve your CCI, your first CCI? Um, well, my story is a, a little bit similar. So I was studying around the same uh, year time frame as Mark was talking about. But I saw a job ad in a, a computer user magazine that said, come to our school, get your CCIE, and we'll hire you at our consulting firm for $120,000 a year. So at the time, I didn't even know what CCI was. But I said, you know, this sounds pretty good, 120 grand. So I'll go for that. So about eight months later, I, I was a CCIE. So you were what, 20 at that time? I was 20 at the time. Yeah, this was uh, 2000. It was January 2002 that I got my first CCIE. Yeah. Weren't you so like just you being the youngest CCIE at that time? Maybe as somebody who was younger now. There's definitely younger now, but it, I may have been the youngest at the time. Who knows? Yeah. But now it's been tw it's been 20 years this past January. I got the official... 20 year coin. Hmm. I think I'm going to get my 15th a year next year. Yeah. So it's still a long time to reach the 20 year mark. Right. So Brian, which CCI, you have so many CCIs, route switch, service provider, security, CCD, which track uh, was the toughest for you? Um, I would say probably data center. Um, Mark and I developed data center together. We were studying for it together and we kind of split up the topics. Um, and I was working on more of the networking aspect and Mark was working on more of the computing aspect. And that was kind of a big hurdle for me because, um, I hadn't been into servers and stuff for years and years. So it was, you know, relearning a lot of those new technologies like storage networking was completely foreign to both of us at the time. Um, you know, there's a lot of just core networking in there, like layer two switch switching, layer three routing, but there's a lot of, of specialized stuff that is, you know, specific to that individual gear. So just being, you know, kind of a, a foreign unknown, uh, that's what made it kind of the most, most difficult in my opinion. Nice. Yeah. For me, it was always voice. The route switch was cakewalk. Service provider was easy. Security was easy. Voice was like. Oh my God. I still remember my first question was, um, how's the call going from here to here when there's no route in the routing table, you know, cause I was always mm -hmm. thinking from the network side and I wasn't thinking about voice. So yeah, voice was the toughest for me. So Mark, uh, what study pattern do you recommend to students who are trying to achieve their CCIE? Yeah, well, I would say that it takes, uh, I think as I, alluded to earlier, it takes sacrifice. So you really have to count the cost up front and, you know, be sure that those who are around you that love you and support you are, you know, really able to, uh, to bear that sacrifice of, of time. Um, it takes a lot of study. We, we used to say that, you know, you really need to go and do a preliminary read and understand at a basic level and then go try those concepts. And from what you've learned works and more importantly, doesn't work, uh, go back to the books and this time really gain a thorough understanding of what it is that you're, uh, you know, trying to learn and, and accomplish and then go back and, and try it again uh, and really understand that at a fundamental level what, uh, you know, what the protocols, um, what the technologies do. And I, I really think that passing the exam is a byproduct of understanding those fundamentals at a, at a deep level. Um, so in terms of study patterns, I mean, I would, I would study days after work. I would study pretty much every weekend, um, taking one weekend off maybe every couple months, uh, you know, to recharge. Uh, I think some rest and some play is certainly important in there. Um, a lot of good sleep, 
Um, I would love to say that exercise is really important to that. And I think that it is, but I was not exercising at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yep. it, it's a lot of studying. What about you, Brian? What do you think should be a study pattern for students who are trying to achieve their CCI? Yeah, I like what Mark said, where we kind of had this four step approach, uh, get a basic understanding of the technologies, try out the basic technologies on the on the command line, like on hands on examples, then go back to the reading, go back to videos and learn more. So it's, it's kind of like an incremental process where you're you're trying to uh, chip away slowly. You know, sometimes they say, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So you have to plan long-term and, you know, plan out the, the blueprint. What's uh, what topics are you going to tackle at what time? And, you know, try to stick to a study schedule. And, and, and like Mark said, you know, it's, it's tough fitting that in with work and family and everything, but as long as you can be consistent, even if you can fit in, you know, a half an hour, an hour a day, and then on the weekends or whenever you have off time, spend more time studying. But it's it's just one of those things that with long term repetition, you know, eventually the the topics are going to stick and you're going to be able to to understand that stuff long term. Makes sense. Makes and sense. to not get frustrated because you it's going to it's going to be arduous and, you know, you may have failure attempts there certainly a number of people that pass on their first attempt, that is not the majority. And so I think if you go in thinking, this is just like any other exam, and you're going to nail it the first time, you're kind of setting yourself up for um, disappointment and, and potentially, you know, being willing to walk away from it. Um, and that you, you kind of have to guard yourself against that, I think, and, and understand that there's going to be failures. And this is going to be one of the hardest things that you've done. Um, but that the reward will will certainly be worth it so not giving up right yeah i see there's a customer question here uh brian was there ever a time you felt like giving up or taking a step back uh, from studying so in my particular case uh i did not pass the security exam the first time so that was a little disappointing getting that that failure email uh you know unfortunately we're inviting you to retest as some people say um so yeah, it's definitely easy to get burnt out sometimes and to, to lose motivation. But I think that's why it's it's best to set small realistic goals where you can't really plan to, you know, work eight hours a day and then study six hours a day and sleep for half an hour. You know, as long as you can make small manageable goals, I think that's really what the long term goal is to not get burnt out. Makes sense. That's pretty good advice. So, uh, Brian, what do you think a company needs? Do you think they need a specialist, like a jack of all, having CCNA route switch or CCN, uh, CCNA, uh, CCNP route switch, CCNP service provider, like a jack of all, or should we aim for CCI and not care about the CCNP? That's a good question. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing recently at INE is we're working on career paths, which is basically mapping our content to kind of like a job role that you would see in, uh, like if you search dice.com or, you know, so we've been doing research into what type of skills are, are really necessary for practical people out there in the field. So in general, I would say you, you end up being a more jack of all trades when you're just starting to get into the field, maybe as like a, you know, a junior network administrator or a first level network administrator, you need to know more stuff than networking. You need to know cloud and virtualization and, you know, Linux and windows and stuff like that. But I think as you get further into your career, you generally start to specialize more. And, you know, that's where really something like you know, a CCIE and collaboration, for example, comes in handy where, you know, you can you can have more of a, a laser focus on those type of implementations or, you know, designs that that are more applicable to that type of uh, more narrow field. Makes sense. Uh, Mark, you've been in the industry for so long. What do you think is the take? Of, what do companies want? Like, yeah, would you I hire think... a CCNP, a jack of all, or would you hire like a CCIE? Right, right. Well, and as we're talking about the CCs, I mean, a lot of times we're, you know, whether it's 
uh, at the NP level, the professional or the expert level, a lot of times we are talking about networking, um, although obviously, you know, collaboration goes beyond that security. Um, but we're, you know, not necessarily getting into all of the aspects of what a, an IT or even a, a, a um, enterprise or organization needs uh, related to technology. So uh, I think that we, we used to say that you needed to be shaped like a T that is kind of broad across a lot of different areas and then deep in one. Um, and I think that still holds true. Um, you know, I think that employers are looking for those who have a broad understanding <clears throat> of most of the, you know, general workings of computer systems, um, the networking, the, the OS, uh, and to some degree, they desire those that can understand the applications, even if you're not necessarily a programmer or a software architect, uh, that those reside on. And certainly, obviously, cloud uh, architectures play into that and do change that game uh, quite a bit. Um, I think that it's really important still to be specialized. And I think that's, uh, that, that's really critical if you, you know, like Brian said, as you go on to your career, if you want to advance and you want to be, you know, really uh, not only relevant to the organization, but beneficial, uh, I think that specialization is, is very key um, with, uh, you know, a continuing broadening of your overall understanding of the organization needs. And if, if I could just add one thing, I would say that, uh, you know, while this does not necessarily tend to be what most people in, in the IT industry have, um, if you do possess or can uh, work on an understanding of really what business is about uh, and not just the technology, but, you know, what business trends are, what businesses are trying to achieve at a higher level, and you can understand and interpret that into what actually needs to be done at a technical level, uh, I think that will take you very far in, in your career because I think that businesses are really looking for or uh, individuals who are able to understand what their needs are and then, you know, go take and run with those and be specialized, be, be experts in their field. Nice. Awesome. So Brian, how different is certification from the real world? I mean, you know, technology is changing so fast. There are new technologies coming in. Do we keep studying forever? It is the constant hamster wheel, isn't it? Where everything is constantly changing. It seems like we're always, you know, having to keep up on our reading or watching videos, learning new things all the time. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, kind of just a necessary evil that, that comes along with this field. So, you know, I've, I've learned so much more now since I've gotten my CCIE than, than I had up to that point. And I, th I thought I knew a lot about networking at the time. But it seems like the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I, in fact, learned something new from Keith the other day in our chat discussion where he said, show run line. I didn't know that. So that was pretty cool. That's right. It actually shows you the numbering, right? So what about you, uh, Mark? How different is the certification from the real world industry? Uh how is certification different from the real world? Well, I guess if you want to, you know, bring it to that kind of binary, I would say that there are those that can certainly get lost in that um, certification path and they are just going after, you know, one cert after another and, and accumulating those. They may or may not, depending on the number of years and time that they have in the industry, uh, they may or may not actually have experience in all of those certifications. So I wouldn't say that certifications for the sake of certifications are necessarily beneficial. Um, certifications for advancement and for really, you know, proving to yourself and to potential employers or current employers um, what your skill set and abilities are, are very important. Um, but I think just like in academia, you can get lost in constantly going to school and, you know, you know, getting another degree, getting another degree, PhD, you know, multiple doctorates. And, you know, maybe you have a, a profession as a um, as a professor, you know, at that point. Uh, so I think that there is a, a 
a, a big difference between the certification world and real world application. Uh, I think that one prepares you for the other and leads you to the other. Uh, but yeah, unless you're going to go into a career of, of teaching, which is great, obviously, um, <laughs> then you would, you would want to, you know, ensure that what you're doing is aligned with the needs of either the organization you're at or where you uh, intend to go in your path. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, certification definitely helps in getting your foot in the door, but you really have to know your stuff, you know, to retain that job or grow in the industry. Like you, know, you cannot just be a paper certification. You really have to right. know your stuff. It's funny you but bring definitely that up helps in the door. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I was no. I was designing a, a website for a doctor back in like nineteen ninety five using I don't know, like Microsoft front page or something. Um, and he was standing over my shoulder and he's pointing and telling me what to do and and or just what he wants and he was very kind about it. And at one point I was talking to him about some certification, I don't remember what it was, and um, and he points to the uh, to the, his degree on the wall, his, his medical degree. And he said, you see that? And I said, yeah. And he said, it don't mean shit. He said, it <laughs> just gets you in the door. He's like, everything you do up to getting that is important because you need to learn it. But the actual degrees, they don't mean anything. It just gets you in the door. And I was like, huh, it's a doctor telling you this. All right. Well, so I, I resonate with what you're saying. Yep. Pretty much. So I have a question here in the chat. It says, uh, when studying for CCI, how do you overcome the forgetting curve? For example, I studied for OSPF for weeks and then studied for BGP and I totally forgot OSPF. Uh, Brian? Yeah, I think the key for this is really repetition that the just the breadth of topics that you need to learn for this certification is so large that it's definitely easy to get lost in the weeds where you know you're you're studying one topic and then you jump to another one and before you know it the first topic you you forget all the details so i would just say that you need to set a, a study schedule where you're you're repeating the topics over and over throughout your uh, you know your your attempt at studying so that you don't focus for a month on one protocol and move to the next one that you would kind of intersperse it, you know, over and over and over to, to be able to, uh, to retain the information long-term. So basically practice quite a lot. Not practice, speed. practice, practice. Exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. Do you agree with that Mark? Yeah, I agree. Exactly. You know, going deep into a particular topic, but then, as Brian said, coming back in a circular fashion and revisiting those is, is really key. It's really important. I would also say to trust the studying that you've done. And as long as it's not solely book knowledge and you're actually putting fingers to the keyboard, you would be surprised what you remember even when you don't think you do. Uh, I remember getting into a command line of an iOS device, which I hadn't at the time. This is, I don't know, five some years ago, I hadn't actually been in iOS in a long time. And, you know, maybe this is only three years ago. I hadn't actually been in um, NXOS at the time for, for quite a while either. I've recently gotten back into those um, out of a few projects needs. And I thought, oh, what is the, and my fingers started typing. And it, it, was, it was like my head was having an out of body experience watching my fingers do things that they were like, how do you know this? So I would say trust your body and trust your studying, continue to study in a circular fashion and revisit topics, very important. Um, but, you know, but trust that what you've committed to memory and slept on will, it, it'll come back to you in the, in the moment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, keep doing the same stuff again and again, it kind of becomes muscle memory then, right? All right, so uh, Brian, what changes do you see in the industry and market trends for students who are just starting their career? Like if I was a student and let's say if I was starting my career right now, what should I do? 
so I think the big trend lately is automation and uh, centralization of the control plane of, of a lot of systems, like, um, you know, making the system a little, bit, a little bit more abstract from what's going on. So I would say for people that are getting into the field that it's still definitely important to go through the foundations of uh, networking in terms of, you know, how do the layer two protocols work? How do the layer three protocols work? Because when you get to a system where some of that is abstracted, like a SD WAN or like ACI, for example, you know, you may be doing some very basic pointing and clicking in order to configure the system. But if something goes wrong, you really need to know what's going on behind the scenes of what are the individual working components that are really building, you know, that that system in order to combine everything together. So definitely, you know, it's 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 kind of a change in, in the way that we design networks and the way that we implement networks, but still behind the scenes, it's it's the same core protocols that we've been talking about for the, the past 20 years that really make up everything uh, at the end of the day. Nice. That's informative. Um, Mark, what about you? Uh, what changes yeah, do you see I, in the industry? I agree with what Brian said. Um, you know, software is eating the world. And so understanding the basics of, uh, you, you don't have to be a you know, deep software developer. You don't have to develop in C or Java or, and understand everything about that. But understanding, I would say Python is by far the most widely used language in the world and certainly in uh, IT and, and networking, not just in uh, software development. And so understanding basic scripting, um, understanding Git repository and uh, how to turn code or sorry, how to turn infrastructure into code. So infrastructure as code um, is really key right now. It's, it's what every organization is either all, just recently underwent uh, or most of them are undergoing currently or, or preparing to undergo a transform a transformation from their traditional you know, network configs that are disparate. Brian alluded to SD-WAN. So we have the idea of templatized configs with variables, um, you know, so turning their disparate configs in every different device, <clears throat> excuse me, into, um, into templated configs, into those that are stored as text in code in simple repositories, <clears throat> and that can use tools like Ansible and Terraform in order to deploy those. So, so yeah, for those just getting started, I would say there's still a lot of importance and there always will be on fundamental networking protocols. BGP is BGP, whether you go to a Juniper device, an Arista device, NSX, CCIE, AWS, or Azure, it's, it's the same, right? And BGP won't change in that way. I mean, it, it'll continue to advance, um, but it's still critically important understanding <clears throat> when to stretch an L2 network and when not to still critically important, you know, understanding asymmetric traffic paths, uh, but being able to uh, learn and understand cloud architectures, which again, use the same fundamental technology, but do have some, you know, nuanced differences just in their implementation and then scripting and infrastructure as code is, is key. Thank you, Mark. That was amazing. I have another question from in the comment. What new technologies, uh, Brian and Mark, what are you learning these days? Uh, for me personally, um, I just completed a course on uh, Meraki networking, which is a, another Cisco company that they use a, a centralized GUI for controlling their system. So at the end of the day, there was really nothing new about the technology. It was still the same layer two switching, layer three routing and BGP, like Mark said, but, you know, just learning a new approach uh, to it and seeing how you can control the network centrally and like with templates, Mark was saying. So it, again, at the end of the day, it's, it's the same, you know, same old hat, same old protocols, but just a new take on it that it's uh, interesting to see, you know, what are the different ways that you can, uh, uh, implement these technologies in just a, an easy point and click type network today that everything used to be manually managed, like Mark was saying, separate CLIs everywhere in the network. Now you just have, you know, a central GUI where you can 
click and everything just magically works. What about you, Mark? What are you learning these days? Yeah, um, you know, I've actually started to learn Python about seven years ago um, and, you know, developed some some scripts that were very usable and and um, but but rudimentary. Uh, and so recently, I've actually just gotten back into <clears throat> taking a couple courses to deepen my understanding of software development and architecture, uh, especially as I'm working with companies to lead uh, software development efforts uh, for SaaS products. So, um, you know, not not necessarily architecting or uh, certainly not programming myself, but understanding all of the various aspects of the development process and and then you know trying to help lead those teams and then incidentally i've actually picked up a couple projects in the last two years that involved nsx as well so i've i've been working with ccie since it first came out um got pulled into the ncme business unit right as cisco was reacquiring them and i had picked up on a little bit of nsx at the time uh just had some study materials but no real lab to work with and then, like I said, just recently, these new projects, which uh, use NSXT, uh, which is the new flavor uh, versus V, which is it, it's, it's fairly different. Um, I've actually been doing a, a decent amount with that as well. So it's been been a lot of fun. Nice. You've been busy. I love to keep learning. And to your question earlier, you know, I think I think to really be successful in this type of a field, committing to be and hopefully just innately being a lifelong learner uh, and just staying curious is it, it's it's really important. And I think it it makes it not so tedious and cumbersome to learn it, but it it makes it fun. Yeah, learning has always been the key point in the IT industry because technology is changing so fast. You have to constantly be in touch. You may not be an expert, but you need to be in touch with the new technologies. Okay, so Brian, uh, what do you see as the biggest need in the industry at the moment? Like what technology do you see as going big? Uh, and do you think that's gonna change in the future? Mm, I'm not really sure about what technology is big right now, but I think that there's still a big skills gap in the industry and a, a shortage of uh, just qualified engineers to fill uh, a lot of the roles that are out there. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, to your question before, if you're just starting to get into the industry, what type of technologies or what type of things would you get into? What I would recommend to do is is to look at some job sites and look at the, the type of roles that you might want to obtain in the future, you know, maybe like a three to five year plan. And that can give you an idea of what are some of the, the trends and what companies are looking for in terms of things like uh, like Python automation, like Mark said, is, is definitely great to get into. Uh, to do uh, network automation, in addition to just kind of our classic, you know, layer two, layer three, uh, on-prem networking, where a lot of things are moving to the cloud nowadays. So you need to know how does uh, networking work in uh, AWS? How does it work in Azure? So it's going to be the same principles at the end of the day, but knowing the specific implementation of how you design something for an on-premise network versus a, a cloud deployment or like a software as a service, et cetera. You know, it's definitely uh, something that I, that I would look into as you're you're starting to get into the industry or just trying to improve your, your skill set and your marketability. Nice. What about you, Mark? Uh, what do you think is big right now in the industry? And do you think anything's going to change? Yeah, well, I'll take your second question first. Do I think anything's going to change? It will always change, um, which goes back to the point of lifelong learning, as well as, you know, understanding that Solomon was right. Like, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything is cyclical. If you go back and read RFCs from 20 or 30 years ago, you'll see that a lot of the things that they were trying to achieve, we're still doing today. I mean, ATM Lane was just the XLAN. It really was just overlays, right? Um, and so we, we kind of constantly come back to a lot of the same things in terms of, you know, what's important today. I think that might be a little different uh, in terms of what's in demand than what you might want to do or enjoy doing. 
Um, first of all, I think that pretty much every IT career is still in demand. Uh, you know, whether you're going into compute, virtualization, um, <clears throat> running container and orchestration systems around that, which Kubernetes is certainly very hot and networking with Kubernetes is, uh, you know, Cilium and, and Calico and things like that are, are very much in demand um, as more and more development goes towards containerization. But uh, traditional networking, cloud uh, architectures and cloud networking, all of these are still very much in demand. And what I would say is, <clears throat> you, I think what is really helpful in order to ensure that you're going to enjoy doing whatever it is you choose, whatever path you take, is to reach out to some people that you may know and trust. And if you don't, then, you know, try to find some people or just randomly reach out, uh, reach out to people on LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, some people may not have the time, but a lot of people, you'll be surprised, will take 30 minutes to talk with you and give you an idea of what their day-to-day -day activities look like. Um, but I think it's really important before you choose, oh, I want to be a sysadmin or I want to be a network engineer or I want to go into collaboration or, you know, software design uh, to really, you know, talk to people and understand what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. And is that the kind of role that you would like? Nice. All right. So Brian, what keeps you busy these days? What keeps me busy these days? Besides uh, me. Well, it's the, yeah, besides you, right? It's well, it's the constant hamster wheel. So um, we're always in the constant process of updating older content, you know, as technologies change as the new certification blueprints are announced as, as new technologies are introduced. So uh, like I said, uh, what I was just working on recently was a course for uh, Meraki networking. Uh, next, I'm working on some stuff with uh, Cisco SD-WAN. We're going to be adding more hands-on labs uh, to our platform for SD-WAN, uh, which I'm looking forward to. And then um, we're going to be working on a project. I can't give too many details now, but a project that's going to be a combination of cloud networking plus uh, on-premise networking at the same time. So, uh, you know, like Mark was talking about, it's, it's definitely important to understand how uh, infrastructure as code works and how you can deploy networks, VPNs, et cetera, in the cloud to talk to you know, your, your physical network because it's very few and far between that you would see um, any businesses, uh, resources uh, kind of centralized in their own data center. Today, most of the time you have a combination of, of cloud applications plus maybe some self-hosted stuff but then ultimately these applications need to talk to each other. So you need to understand how networking works in the cloud and on premise, and then how to, you know, connect those two networks together. Yeah. Cloud's been a big challenge for me because I'm thinking from the traditional network perspective and for I'm sure. like, where's this shit, where's this shit going? <laughs> you know, where's that cable connecting? So, yeah. What about you, Mark? What keeps you busy? Well, um, learning how to run a business is, is uh, one of the aspects, you know, when you launch on your own and, uh, and first try to make sure that you can feed yourself and your family and then move on to try to grow the business. It, uh, it's challenging. It's, it's a lot more than just doing the work of whatever it is that you set out to do. It's, you know, learning accounting and learning, uh, or how to find a good accountant at least, but um, to some degree understanding that and building sales pipelines and marketing and, and a lot of fun stuff that I've worked with businesses and understood to a degree, you know, what their various roles were and therefore, you know, what the senior leadership was trying to achieve and take that back to the technical team and find ways to implement that. Um, but when it's uh, sink or swim, it, it's quite a different story. Um, so there's been that aspect, uh, which has been fun along the way and, and certainly challenging, uh, especially since I launched in April 1 of 2020, right? Right as COVID was hitting, it's a great time to start a brand new business. Um, but, uh, but working with customers and, and, and kind of going back to, and the reason that I brought this up of, you know, 
what I've been doing in, in running my own business, it's really helped me to understand that senior leadership uh, level and what, you know, when I meet with a CIO or a CISO and they're talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges of the business and what it is that they're trying to achieve, the outcomes that they're trying to achieve, a lot of times there aren't the people that are in uh, in, in the you know business leadership executive roles don't necessarily even CIOs and CISOs not all of them necessarily understand how to do something or how to put it into practice at the technical level, and then you have those that are in the infrastructure uh, in IT and in software, and of course those two teams don't necessarily talk to one another, um, so there has to be someone to bridge that gap, and really to interpret what is coming from that senior leadership level into uh, development efforts and in, well, software development efforts and into infrastructure development efforts. Um, and so a, a lot of what I do these days is work with companies to help them understand and, you know, help, help the, the technical teams understand what the business is trying to do and help the business understand some of the challenges that the IT teams have uh, and, and Kind of play translator and i don't know i, I like to say that uh I play family therapist for organizations at times <laughs> so it, it's interesting if you just get a lot of people into a room and have them talk about what some of their daily challenges are without going too in depth uh it's actually interesting how people begin to align and understand one another and and have more open dialogue um, just as a result of that nice so, um, Mark, how can folks find you or get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, well, my, my Twitter's down below my name, it looks like. Uh, I don't get on Twitter very often these days, but, uh, but if you ping me, I've got notifications turned on, so I'll certainly uh, see that. Uh, I, I think LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me. Um, I think it's uh, slash in slash Mark Snow. So, yeah reach out on LinkedIn. Um, you can check out my website, deftcon, D-E-F-T-C-O-N.io. Um, and you can book an appointments with me there as well. So I would say those two Perfect. ways. Perfect. How about you, Brian? Uh, like Mark said, probably best uh, place is LinkedIn. Uh, I don't know my LinkedIn offhand, but you can also get me on Twitter at Brian McGann. Uh, likewise, I have notifications on, or you can email me, brian at ine.com or bmagan at ine.com. So any questions that you guys have, I'm more than happy to, to help out any way that I can. Perfect. All right. So it looks like we're getting uh, close to wrapping up this discussion. I would personally like to thank Brian McGann and Mark Snow for taking out the time to join us here today. And I would also like to thank our production team, which basically they work really hard behind the scenes to make this happen. And uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, please get in touch with us over email or through any social media like LinkedIn or Twitter. Of course, this video is going to be uploaded on our site, on our platform, so that you can watch this later again. And again, I really appreciate everyone taking out the time to join us. And I hope to see you in our future INE Live. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Rohit. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Good right. to see you, Brian. Thanks. Bye.